there. So are you Hello. Gonna, and David is with us and I just am so excited because we've got this great advocate from Texas tonight and he's going to be helping us out because I know this time of year parents are spending a lot of times in those conference rooms talking about extended school year services. So this is a great time of year for us to talk about how you can individualize it and make sure it really meets the needs of your child versus just what the district has to offer you. So I'm excited to introduce our guest this evening. He is the Director of Advocacy Services in Texas for a law firm. And besides being the director there of all their advocacy services, you can see from these photos that he's an explorer. He is a drummer in a local band. And yes, he even is a former Marine. So I know some parents are probably thinking, uh, Marine, I would love to have a former Marine Sergeant come to one of my IEP meetings. But the reality is what I found, um, knowing that David throughout the past couple of years is that he's not that really kind of gruff uh, Marine that you might have a stereotypical um, view of, but instead he is just this knowledgeable advocate that has so much breadth of experience that he brings to not only us tonight, but all the families that he works with in Texas, such um, unique ways of making sure that people at the IEP table know what's what and how he can magically sometimes get positive results for students with disabilities. So I'm gonna do a quick tech ch check our technology, so we have a couple of people on live. If you can hear us and see us, give us a thumbs up so we know that we're not just talking here and nobody hears us, then I think we're A-OK, -okay. so that's good. Um, if you are new to our show, I am Charmaine Tanner, and I'm a advocate, a parent, a retired teacher, and also author of a number one best-selling book, The Art of Advocacy, A Parent's Guide to a Collaborative IEP Process. So we are going to jump right in with our guest tonight. He's going to talk a little bit about extended school year services and give us kind of an overview. But then we're also going to be asking um, and kind of picking his brain for maybe some specific strategies that you can use when you're speaking up for your child for extended school year services. So David, welcome, welcome to our show. Well, thanks Charmaine. It is a pleasure and an honor to spend uh, some time with those who uh, uh, are talking about this stuff. It's really important to uh, carry the conversation. The fact that some folks are on and you and I are talking long after the day is done shows that uh, the, what connects us all is our passionate commitment to what we do. Yes, exactly. So I think it, I think it would be kind of fun because, you know, I think if people look at, oh, you know, here's this gentleman from Texas, but Charmaine saying that he was a former, you know, um, Marine soldier, how did you then make that trans <laughs> transformation to becoming, I know first you were a social worker, but how did all that transformation happen in your career? Well, it, you know, a lot of stuff happens in lives, not by choice, but circumstance and opportunity. And um, I'd spent a year in college. Uh, Marine Corps had, or military at the time, had an incredible GI Bill. And college even then, even now, is very expensive. And so if you go to, the, go to the military, and the Marines obviously, I think, have a higher profile sometimes, at least back at the time I went in, uh, during the early 70s, is that uh, they pay for your college. And so the idea of not having a college debt was really helpful. So when the Marine Corps for about three and a half years got out, went back to school. And during um, summer, I took a summer job at a place called Dead State School. And even though Texas still has half of all the institutionalized 
individuals uh, in the country, and Denton State School still exists, it was a facility for those back then called mentally retarded, now intellectual disabilities. And during that summer, uh, and I thought they hired me, oh, because I was a student, I knew something, major in education, well, they hired me to lift. And this facility had a probably, you know, seven, 800 uh, adults in various ranges. And they hired me to lift because back then the unit I was on or the dorm I was on was non-ambulatory, severely uh, intellectually disabled, nonverbal. But as I watched these, oh, call them grandmother types who'd been with these individuals for five, 10, 20 years, is they'd had conversations all day long. And, th and these are children who couldn't communicate. They knew their look, mm -hmm. they knew their utterance, they knew their tilt of their head, they knew their arm gesture. Uh, they had some primitive communication boards where you could take a, you know, they might grab a pointer and go, yes, no. Uh, so it was just absolutely fat. My world was transformed because, you know, I came out a hard, you know, I was a Sergeant Marine Corps, hard, hard charging fit and, and looked at the world in very black and white and here are these grandmothers some of them some of them did not graduate high school and or they dropped out uh, they education wise they weren't you know college students but it was just amazing from what i learned during the three and a half years i spent on that dorm uh because it was just I, I learned something every day on how to communicate how to work with some of the feeding was three hours long because that's how long it took the individual to work. And, and uh, so I kind of hit me, I said, what, I'm gonna get paid to do this? Right. And my, uh, so for 20 years, I was uh, working as program coordinator, social worker, if you will, and then uh, ended up in the rural areas of Texas. Uh, I live in a little place called Burnett County. It's about 80 miles north of uh, San Antonio probably about 60 miles as the crow flies northwest of uh, Austin. And so we served uh, individuals who were leaving uh, some type of uh, facility. It could be a state facility or a mental health facility or acute care facility. And as they came out there, guess what? Had to start doing it. If they were kids, you went to IP meetings. So that's where we uh, learned to do it. And fortunately, uh, three of the folks or two of the folks I worked with, Marty Sirkel, who's a senior attorney, and Daniel Garza, who just left for disability rights uh, early last year, uh, we we're all social workers together. So and, and they went off to law school. So it was really kind of fun coming back in 97 after about 20 years of uh, social work to come back as an as an advocate, just doing this. It's wonderful. And by then I had my kids and one of them, guess what, had a uh, disability. So I, as a father, 20 plus years ago, I was going to IP meetings. Right. And so, so we just expanded. So there's about, uh, they average five or six attorneys at the firm, 10 to 12 advocates spread out across Texas. And I'm and one, one, one correction, I'm not just a Texas advocate. I go all over uh, the United States. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I live about 40 miles away from Fort Hood and we have 60,000 troops. And as they circulate through, some of them take them with me. I go to other states. Um, uh, I, you know, had a due process in Arizona and some cases in California. It's not all the states, but it's fun to go out of state with the families. Um, it's not heavy duty and you know, I'll usually fall off, but I, I do love experiencing other states as well. Cause each state, even though it's one law, IDA, 504 ADA, it's so different in every state. Everybody practices it a little differently. In Texas, it's kind of a little hard contact. I, I think the joke I tell, if you go to the Walmart, you'll find one section for the football pads, one section for the hockey pads, and then one section for the special ed advocate pads where you put on your helmet and pads before you go to a IEP meeting. So, and so here I am, and we're, we're very fortunate. And, and Mr. Sirkale, or Marty, has been, uh, been a friend for 30 plus years, and he's allowed, he's uh, let advocates kind of find a a place as a law office, which I think gives us a little more punch and access to all the legal tools and access to attorneys. So we've had a really robust uh, relationship and that enables us to serve uh, not everybody who walks through the door. Yeah, I think that would be an ideal situation. I mean, you know, if parents are looking for help, they can maybe start with the advocate. And then, you know, if there's, you know, more situations arise that you need the advice or help from an attorney, then 
you know, with your firm, the firm that you work with, you know, that's available. So that makes it a, a more, I don't know, kind of smooth transition for families that then they have to, you know, engage an attorney to provide some kind of help. Well, and it's a full service law firm. We do guardianships, wills, uh, working with families in the juvenile justice system, CPS, because when you think about the, you know, the needs of any individual, especially kids, and they have a disability, you know, guess who has a tendency to get in trouble a little more, to go to the DAP a little more, to go to the JJP anymore, or, you know, if you whack a teacher, it's a felony in most states. And if that teacher's blocked in the door and that kid has a head of steam and hits the teacher, well, Maybe a felony, you know. So, so it all it's all kind of integrated into one ball of wax. So, so what we do, we don't look at it just special ed or just um, 504, or just ADA or just art. It's it's a, it's a kid. A kid has a disability. He has this range of needs, or his family may have this range of needs. Uh, and and some of it, it could be just you know they need stable housing, um, you know, so the kid can play at night. So it it's, it varies, but we've been fortunate and blessed uh, all those years that our, in our social work background uh, serves as well. well. Let's jump in to the uh, topic of the evening. <laughs> well, we can. So I, I didn't know if you wanted to share um, maybe just some general, you know, federal kinds of practices sure. for extended school year. And then maybe we can talk about some advocacy strategies that would help um, families. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, also, too, um, you know, I, we had a kind of an epiphany when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans because we ended up with thousands and thousands of, of kids here in Texas. And as we were serving these families, we were just overwhelmed. And finally, one one really wonderful family said, David, quit talking about all this stuff. Just tell me what to do. And it kind of resonated in court because sometimes we talk in the theoretical or in the abstract and, and parents – uh, with kids in trouble. They just need to know what's it about. So uh, hence the toolbox was uh, uh, born where it's just some very simple one, two, three steps that anybody, uh, you don't have to know your procedural safeguards or read a complicated, it's just if you follow the process. So if you think about, you know, what is IDA? It's only two things. It's data-driven or assessment-driven, data assessment, information, it's data-driven, but it's consensus-based. Consensus implies a relationship. And that's it. That's all ideas. Is it's data driven, it's consensus based, and in that there's three distinct steps. It's like going to the doctor's office. First thing you do when you go to the doctor's office, what do you, what do they do? They analyze, they diagnose, and evaluate. Well, what's the first thing you do in 504, RTI, ADA, MOUSE? They they evaluate, assess, and the recommendation. And just like in the doctor's office, after the doctor pokes your project, uh, takes an X-ray, takes a blood test. Those results of the recommendations of that testing become the plan. Well, guess what happens in special ed? The, the, the recommendations of the assessment, because unless it's assessed, you don't get it. That's how it works. So unless it's assessed, evaluated, you don't get the plan. So the plan of the doctor's office is get a shot, get a treatment, you know, get a, a pill, whatever it is. Well, and the plan for uh, parents is IP, BIP, Accommodation, modification, supplementary services, all that related service, whatever it is, and then and then at the doctor's office when you leave, where are you going to get where are you going to get the treated? You know, you're going to go to the hospital, you're going to go get it to the clinic, go home, and same way is the placement. So you really think of the just it's a data driven consensus based process, which means you want to talk about it before you nuke them. Is it assessment drives the plan, plan drives the placement. So all a parent has to know. Is are you talking about the assessment? You talking about the plan? Are you talking about the assessment? And if you have a problem with the placement or the plan, well, what does the assessment tell you? And if the assessment doesn't tell you what's going on, you have a disagreement about the behavior intervention, the IEP, how it's the strategy. Well, you go back to the assessment. And if the assessment doesn't talk about it, guess what you're going to do? Just like the assessment. You know, if the doctor do, doctor's magic doesn't work, you're, you're going to go back and do more assessment, or you're going to get a specialist. We have specialists, you know, psychologists, PhDs, or uh, states have regional service centers, use lots of things drawn. So really, that's it. It's a, all IDA is, it's a data-driven, assessment-driven, consensus-based process, which has three steps. Assessment drives the plan, plan drives the placement, which brings us to ESY, because some kids, um, they need a little more than that, because we know there is regression 
during the summer. And that leads us into ESY. And, and so if you really think about it, what each ESY is, the actual uh, statute and reg, let me pull it up here real quick so I can quote you. And it's, uh, you know, CFR 300-116 says each school must ensure an extended school year is available to provide FAPE. Well, what's a FAPE? Free and appropriate education, consistent with the second paragraph, and it must be provided if a child's IP team on an individualized basis. Now, let me let me let me throw that out there because that's one of the first steps of ESY you want to look at is schools, by their very nature, tend to be cookie cutter. Uh, they've had some disabilities they've worked with for X amount of years. This is what we do. We have this program. We have this service. During the summer, we have six weeks of this and this. Well, that's not what the law says. The law says is the IEP term, the IEP team on an individual basis. That means it's individualized because that's what IDA is. It's based on the unique individualized needs. Again, they got to be assessed. Okay, don't don't ever lose that fact. It's always got to be assessed. It's always got to be evaluated. It's always got to have some data to determine that. Otherwise, it's I think, I believe, I observe. Johnny did a had a great day. <laughs> uh, data drives everything. If you can't put it in some kind of metric, some kind of numbers, then it's a long conversation. But uh, and I think one of the uh, Pete Wright manuals has a quote from Descartes that says, "If it's observable, it's measurable. It's a, if it's observable, it's measurable." And that's it. You can measure anything, academic, non-academic, take your pick. And so with that three steps, assessment drives the plan, plan drives the placement. During the summer, uh, they have to look at what that child may need during the summer because they might need this ESY or extended school year because of different things that happen. So based on the IP team at some point, usually in the spring, will look at to see if there is necessary provision to go go. Uh, during the summer. And so there's a number of, of sections. I'll, I'll just kind of jump into it. So there's a number of categories they look at. And it's usually, a, it's not summer school. And it must be in, assessed on individualized need. And the state standard that offers that year of service, because sometimes states are different depending on your circuit, we'll go into that a little bit, is that it has, there has to be an analysis data to see if there's some regression or and what it takes to recoup that. Because if during those times of the year where the child is out of school, Thanksgiving, Christmas vacation, spring break, during last summer, what did it say? So capturing data on that IEP, because some of the IEPs are related. So the IEP in May of 2016, the child was at X, Y, or Z level. You come back in the fall, of uh, September 16 and the related IP, you see he was way, way down and he stayed there for a while. Well, that's a, that's probably the cl most classic example of the kid regressed. And he took him a while to recoup because because every kid's gonna regress in the summer. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. right, you don't do it for a while, you know how to do it, but you regress. Uh, I don't even remember what I ate two weeks ago, unless I write it down. So all kids regress during the summer. You're gonna have some, it's not at the same level, but the question is, can they recoup it? And that's really the individualized nature. So you look at those times and you look at the IEP data during those breaks. So during the Christmas break, and I usually like not just the Christmas break, I like to throw in from Thanksgiving to January 1st. Why? Because the kid's out sometimes for a week or more, and then he's only back three weeks, and he's out for another two or three weeks. So not just looking at the Christmas break, but look at the holiday break when instruction. And also remember, they're not uh, toward the end of each semester. They're taking tests. There's end of the year activity. So it's not always direct instruction. So sometimes not just looking at the data and data means here's where that kid was. And it could be behavioral data. It could be core academic data. It could be whatever is in his IEP because because one of the things you're going to do is look at what IEP It's not just um, a math goal or I mean, it's not just a generalized a gen ed math goal or a benchmark. It's what in that IEP didn't progress. So the tighter your IEPs are, the tighter your IEPs are, the tighter you can make a case for ESY. So look at those data and benchmarks. Every school has either a six-week, nine-week. They have some periodic reporting. Those are going to be your benchmarks. And if they go down after a break, that's your, that's your discussion in ESY. What IEP goal does he need to work on? Especially related services, the speech, the OT, the PT, uh, music therapy, 
uh, for those states that have that. Uh, that's what's really, really important. So jumping back in to the ESY uh, standard is you, it's, it's an individual basis. Oh, I just lost my place. Oh my goodness, bear with me. the return to the magic uh, uh, my fingers. So bear with me for just a second. There we go. Okay, back online. So, so it's not just the individualized determination. Is is there's there's certain factors go, that go with it. So most of it in the 2006 regs, they talked about uh, Andy adding language about the effect of regroup, recoupment, and retention. So in in there, they have a kind of a pretty good. And this is out of the 2006 Part B regulations. They talked about the concept of recoupment and likelihood of regression retention to form the basis for many state standards in making ESY eligibility determinations, and they're well-derived for many well-established judicial principles. Because when you think about the standard, we have to provide a FAPE. What's that? Well, usually, uh, we, we, in fact, there's a Supreme, it's what's really exciting, we've had two Supreme Court decisions. One just came out on Friday, it says you can go straight to ADA, depending on the remedy. And we have another one, probably even more important, is what's FAPE? What is FAPE? So we have the Raleigh decision from 1982 that says FAPE is more than de minimis. And some uh, IP teams, if it's a clown, two clowns and a monkey, and the kid has some kind of educational benefit, that's FAPE. And then there's a little higher standard, uh, which is a meaningful educational benefit. We don't know what that is, uh, but what's really refreshing, even the national special ed director says, please get us out of Raleigh. They said they, that's, it's a low bar. That's why we like 504, which is equal access, to equal uh, equal, equal uh, uh, ability to participate. Anyway, jumping back to ESY is the recruit the recruitment regression model is the key. And so through and we won't go we won't get into the litigation or any of that part. But oh, each circuit has developed some different pieces. Uh, if you if you're a fan of rights law, there's some really incredible uh, extended commentary on how ESY works. And so I'll, I'll cover some of those basic concepts because it's basically is this is the kid gonna gonna regress and so give an example the 10th circuit which a number of courts have picked up they have a range of factors in other words what's the degree of regression is it a little bit or a lot what's the exact time of regression what's the ability of the parents to provide educational structure at home what's the child's rate of progress uh, does the child have behavioral or physical problems is it avail are there availability alternative sources Ability of the child to interact with non-disabled children, areas of curriculum that need continuous attention, child's vocational needs, and we requested what are extraordinary in the child's condition. So that's a lot. That's a mouthful. So some circuits, this came out of the 10th circuit, uh, was really, really uh, one of the more complicated ones. Because remember, if you want to make something complicated, take it to a judge. <laughs> the, way, the way this thing was supposed to be designed was supposed to be simple. Parents know their child best, schools know education best, and that's the partnership that comes together based on what? Assessment drives the plan, plan drives the place, that's it. That's supposed to be all that there is. But as, as court decisions take place, it gets more and more complicated. So I just gave you the 10 factor of the 10th circuit. But other courts, uh, and, and Roush versus Fountain back in 94, really kind of has been kind of the mainstream. And there they look at the, what's the regression recruitment, what's the degree of progress, what's the emerging skills or breakthrough opportunities, because sometimes if a child's just beginning to communicate or just beginning to ambulate, you don't want to shut that down. It's emerging skills. Um, right. Are there interfering behaviors? What's the nature and severi severity of the disability? Because sometimes if there are some disabilities that it, it's, you have to, that repetition, or sometimes teachers call it drill and kill all the time because the short-term memory, long-term memory, just not there. Um, some of the fetal alcohol syndrome kids, we, uh, we had a whole surge of adoptions in, from Romania and Russia. Uh, you know, they send the picture of the blue-eyed, uh, wonderful, come on, adopt that. And, they're, and, and they were, you know, a lot of them had, their parents had severe alcohol problems. We had a lot of fetal alcohol syndrome, where the ability to retain information is somewhat impaired. And so having that same uh, uh, consistency throughout the year is really, really apparent, really, really uh, important. And that's why they talk about what's the uh, emergency skills or the nature and severity of the disability and, and special circumstances. 
so there's lots and lots of different pieces. You got to look at what your state is, but it really starts out with that kind of regression and recoupment. Uh, one of the things that that's really important is it has to be about data. So when they just gather around, the, the IP just gathers around the table and says, uh, we've looked at it and we feel the child has not regressed. The question becomes, what's the data? What are the assessment points? What are the data points? What are the benchmarks they use to do that? Because 10 times out of 10, the reason I'm going to get involved in the struggle with a school on behalf of a parent is because there's no data or um, the, the, or the, or because it's our ESY is, ah, oh, we don't do that here. It costs money. Those are all impermissible considerations for serving the child. So it, and also uh, one other thing is it has to be in the child's least restrictive environment. So because sometimes we'll see the LRE be kind of the life skills class in the school down the road. And right. Right. Answer, it has to be in a least restricted environment. So that child's in general ed setting during the year, and that's where the IP is being delivered. There's no reason they have to be in a, a, a segregated or life skills type environment. We see that all the time because those students who typically get ESY tend to be uh, more uh, impacted by their disability. We see a lot, a lot of that. Uh, but it's for anyone, and it could be for a GT kid, it could be for anyone that has that regression. So using kind of that that three, the Texas three-step, even though uh, Charmaine said it wasn't a two-step, but it's really a Texas, Texas three-step. Assessment drives the plan, plan drives the placement, and the same thing is occurring with ESY, but that, regroup, that recoupment, regression, regression, recoupment, call it what you will. So does the child regress to the extent he's not going to be able to recoup those skills quickly in the, in the fall setting? But it all has to do with data. Also, look at the history. If you had DSY for four years in a row in a specific area, math, reading, speech, OT, PT, uh, whatever it may be, uh, that's a good lead-in. You know, what was the data then? Because sometimes they get to middle school, oh, no more DSY. Or they had a middle school, oh, in high school, we don't do it. So what is, what's the history and pattern uh, of that? And then do the flip side, too, because, you know, because that, that's pretty simple. You're just looking at data points and how quickly, they, and so, you know, draw draw a line, have a graph, because even with the um, data points, you can say, well, what's a 56 of what? Is it percentile, the score? So I always look, is just draw, draw a graph. The graph goes like this, and it goes down, and it doesn't go back up, but good visual pieces, just do data points. Uh, if you can't do it, your kids can probably do it for you, because they're tech, more technologically fluent than those of us who still thought the was the cutting edge of technology. So one, one of the other things, too, that I think is important is look at the other side. In other words, what is their policy on ESY? Uh, sometimes if I want to know something about a school, or, uh, talking to – because remember, all school educators have different degrees of experience. They, they, they may be in a, a major urban area where they see every shade and sort of disability. Or they may be in a rural area where they only see – uh, a few of this or that. And so getting a hold of what is the school policy? What is the school policy? So I always ask if, and again, if, if you don't want to go that far, I always ask for the special ed operations manual of the district or, or what is the special ed operations manual of the campus? And it tells them step by step, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And so if I have their policies and procedure on ESY, or FBA or whatever it is, I know exactly what they're supposed to do. And so it's not me, uh, you know, pressuring them, coming in as an advocate from a law firm to do stuff. These are your procedures. So knowing what the procedures are for the school or for the state uh, really puts you in the driver's seat as you go through this. Because ESY, I think about it, in your state, and like Texas as an example, you tend to have these ESY discussions toward the end of the year to look at that year of progress or regression or wherever it is. So in Texas, um, and there's some I, annual IP meetings in the fall and early spring, but most of them fall in, the, fall in uh, March, April, or May. And with that, like in Texas, so we have 420,000 kids in special ed, so there's going to be at least 420,000 ARDS. And so if you're the diagnostician or the person running the ARD, you're just trying to move that, that R through. It's a really compressed type of uh, process. So knowing how they operate, knowing their procedures, knowing their policies on ESY 
or your state policies, because it does vary a little bit right in front of you. And knowing what that is ahead of time makes the conversation not adversarial at all, because when you start asking what's the data, where that is, sometimes, um, you know, you're telling them what to do. You know, if you're an educator and you've been at school for 10 years and you got your master's, having just questioning what you do sometimes can be cause a little defensiveness. Ah, they're asking what I do. They ask for data. I never take data. You know, I've been doing this 20 years. Uh, and so, but having their policy uh, is a real easy conversation. But doesn't your policy say right here you do that? So that's just a little uh, advocate trick is knowing what their policy is. So you're not trying to argue, well, federal law says this or state law says this. Well, in Podunk, uh, ISD out in Podunk City, you're able to do that. So knowing their policy, it's really, really important. And I always make it, if it's, it looks like, because, you know, nobody calls up an advocate says, David, I'm having a really good IP and I want to spend a, bunch of mo spend a bunch of money on it. It's only because something's gone wrong. There's a concern. Something's happened to the kid. Uh, it's progress isn't uh, being maintained, whatever it is. However we get there, it's not because things are going well. So, but we want to leave it uh, just like in camping, we have no trace left behind. You always never want to leave a trace with you. You want to do the same thing. And if you can improve the relationship, especially if the, the, the parent has a better understanding on what they're looking at. And if for the parent to have understanding, just like for the school to have understanding, you walk a mile in their shoes, which is their policy and procedure. It really makes a, a difference or a, or a case. Um, the other way to help sometimes have a conversation is not to file due process or complaint is, what are the due process decisions in your state regarding ESY? And if you look at how the hearing officers ruled, you can kind of see where you, oh yeah, that, I'll get it because, you know, 10 hearing officers ruled that uh, my kid lost a grade level in reading between summer and fall, and he didn't get it back till half a year later. That's a great case, and it helps benchmark that. So it's so there's lots of different ways to kind of uh, be still be the IEP whisperer because the idea is, again, consensus based, it's relationships. So, so sometimes you do have to file something, sometimes you have to, you know, go after them in some way, but nine times out of 10, 90, you know, in fact, look at the metric of Texas. You know, uh, we have a lot of struggles down here in Texas, along the border, rural areas, you name it, it's a struggle. But if you do the metrics, you know, with 420,000 kids, there's only 500 hearings filed every year. That's one, one thousandths of 1%. And because they go to hearing, the 40 or 50 they go to hearing is one one ten thousand to one percent. So of those 500 or 600 filed, only five, 50 or 60, or, or maybe since we have uh, the Cuddy Law Firm down, it may even be 100, but it's still not getting over one tenth of, I'm sorry, one one thousandth of one percent. So the idea of all this litigation out there is kind of a misnomer because so when you run the data, now there are two exceptions, and that's Washington, D.C., where there's thousands of hearings, I don't know, 10,000, I mean, it's, 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 it's 10,000 a year or 15,000 a year, it's, it's, it's incredible, and New York, where there's three or 4,000, but you look at all the other states, California, Texas, it's below 1,000, and so when there's 400,000 or 500,000 kids in those states, and you're only hit 1,000, that's not, I mean, that's not many, so the idea that, um, you know, schools might give you, oh, it's going to be litigated, or is really rare. It's very, very rare that any litigation takes place. It will attract a lot of attention and suck the oxygen out of the room, but that's not how uh, an IP is designed. It's, you know, you get some data, data tells you this, develop the plan, you, know, you have the placement, and you analyze the data. And ESY is just part of that between the summer. Regrushment, regrushment, yeah, that's right. Regrushment, recruitment. It's been a long day. Is recruitment and re, uh, regression and recruitment is two standards. So it's all based on data, and that's really it. If you, if you follow that three step, you have data as you determine whether that child needs um, uh, services or not. You're there. Right, right. There's um, a mom on live with us tonight, Erica, and she, I had asked her because I've been working with Erica. And um, so I asked her if she, you know, what she thought about her son receiving ESY this summer. And she said that, you know, she's kind of wondering about that because right now things aren't going well at that school. And so she's kind of worried about causing more harm than good if he then goes to ESY. So I think sometimes parents need to look at 
you know, maybe your kid does qualify for extended school year services, but for a variety of reasons, maybe you're doing, you know, some kind of, you know, I don't know, scout camp or something else for your child during the summer. He's going to a Y program that you feel like is going to be, you know, meeting his needs better than going to the school's ESY program. Just because your child qualifies doesn't necessarily mean you have to take that offer of services. Well, yeah, and in fact, um, summer vacation, because that kid may benefit, you know, he's, and because of uh, the, uh, the school days have gotten longer, and if he, if he spent nine months going <laughs> for eight hours a day plus homework, maybe he doesn't need that. And, you know, Boy Scout camp, chess camp, summer vacation with the family, uh, that's the wonderful thing about uh, services. If you say no, or in Texas, you say, whoa, you don't, you don't get it. And so just say no, because if there's something more meaningful, uh, if you're going to go to eight weeks of hippotherapy uh, and it's in the middle of a wonderful hill country ranch with horses, who would want to go to a school building in the summer? So absolutely, it's just, it's just a service. It's, uh, I, I, I sometimes put in the category of transportation. A transport, special ed transportation is a related service, but not everybody wants their kid on a special ed bus, some, but sometimes you do. You take it if you want it. You take it if you need it. It's a service to be offered because if you really think, you know, what is a parent's role at, at any IEP meeting? Uh, you're really, you're, you're, you have an equal seat, sit, seat at the table, but you don't have equal input, okay? They will take what you say. They'll listen to your data if you have some. They make the decision. A parent doesn't provide faith. Parent doesn't provide the services. So if you really think of it, it's like a, it's not a contract, but it's like a contract negotiation. At the end of the art, it's like end of buying a house. Contract offered, contract accepted. Contract offered, contract rejected. Well, so at the end of the IP meeting, including ESY service, they're making you an offer of FAPE. They're making you an offer of FAPE with your input. And then you decide, yes, I accept that offer of FAPE, or you say, no, I'm not taking that offer of FAPE, and you use your procedural safeguard. So at the end of the, so, so it's your call as to whether you take those services or not at any time. And during the summer, uh, I'd say a lot of kids, and also uh, ESY services has evolved. I thought it was much richer ESY services 15 or 20 years ago. Budget cuts, cookie cutter approaches, uh, some ESY services three weeks long. That doesn't do much, or maybe it does you know, depending on your kid. So, right. so you're going to, you're going to look at it just like you would any other part of that IEP. It's just uh, another required element that you consider. So they offer it. Maybe you want it. Maybe you don't. So no stress because your role as a parent is all you really think about. And we have a couple of advocates in Ohio to talk about that is the parents don't say a thing. They're just there to listen. You accept the offer of faith or you decline the offer of faith. That's really technically what you're there for. I mean, certainly you can bring your reports and you offer your insight and you can agree or disagree with the different comments. But at the end of the day, your role as a parent, after giving your input, you have a right to be there. You have a right to participate. They have a right to consider. But you say, because school provides the FAPE, you don't. So just uh, look at it. If, if it's merit, merits consideration, weigh it. Uh, you know, talk to grandma and grandma who might have been expecting you to go to their house during, and then make your decision. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a, a helpful way for, for parents to look at that IEP process. Um, you know, and I always encourage parents to bring input, but like you said, at the end of the day, if there's disagreement, it's the responsibility of the district to provide that free appropriate public education. So, um, you know, even if the parent doesn't agree with it, if the district offers that as their offer of faith, then yeah, then the only recourse parents have is to pursue those, you know, procedural safeguards and take some other kind of action um, in order to, you know, continue to seek resolution there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's not it's not a it's not a hill to die on. It's just a routine consideration once a year for services. Uh, also, too, is sometimes you have the ability to negotiate because ESY is not always uh, part of that. Uh, sometimes ESY can be a consideration as compensatory. You know, in other words, they, they 
they didn't do X, Y, or Z. Sometimes ESY becomes kind of a, it's a consideration, but they need it because it's a compensatory. They didn't do it a year before, so they roll it in. So remember, it's all a negotiation. It's always a negotiation. And sometimes we think of it as, uh, you know, maybe we watched Happy Days too many times or Leave it to Beaver, and we think of schools as a safe, you know, we trust schools, they're good folks, and that's true. But but look, but remember, you, you'll spend 30 minutes on Yelp looking for a good restaurant. So you've got to, you've got to, and, 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 but you, and you wouldn't take a bad burrito more than 30 seconds. You wouldn't take uh, a uh, bad milk from Walmart more than seconds. You wouldn't take a uh, bank lost your money more than a day. So why would you take a bad education as a way? Because sometimes what happens, we get two different sets of standards, one for everything else. Look how you look for your pediatrician for your kid or the gluten-free, casein-free diet or all those things you do for a kid. But you go in and you won't, uh, you won't, you'll sign, agree in those states that have it, or you just accept the IP or their decision because they're the school. You, tr you trust the school. Well, that's part of it. Uh, you are, the parent is the default quality assurance, little soapbox here. You are the default. You're the quality assurance for your kid because who knows your child better than anyone else? Not me, the advocate. I know the process better than you, but I don't know your kid. So it's kind of the, uh, you know, the old adage uh, in these conversations tonight, such as we're not going to throw you fish, we're going to teach you fish, because only you know uh, the answer. We're there just to facil facilitate that process. Well, I wanted to throw that in there is uh, ESY is just one of those many uh, data points that you're going to negotiate, whether it's designing an IEP. And, and also, I'll throw in a couple more things I, I should mention. You're going to be working on an IEP. You're going to be working on IP. It's not ESY, we're going to have a social summer camp. It's based on this child's IEP, so all the different things apply. They're going to have a benchmark to start out with. What are they going to work for on the IP data through the process of ESY or BIP? It doesn't have, it could be academic, which is core academic subjects and, and uh, the curriculum, or it could be non-academic, which is everything else, behavioral, social, emotional, related service, whatever that is, but it has to be based on data. So it's not just, okay, we're, you, you cross the threshold, you're in ESY, once you're in ESY, it has to be in a least restricted environment and it has the same uh, parameters as a regular IEP, it doesn't change. In fact, some of that IEP data, you might need an IEP meeting when you come back to look at the data to either change, uh, modify, or keep the IEP that you're working on. So keep that in mind as well, it doesn't change just because it's ESY and it's, uh, you know, with budget cuts or how it's conceptualized, it's not just, oh, we're going to have a great ESY program. They're going to be playing basketball down at the Y. No, 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 no. <laughs> right, right. And like you said, I mean, that's the thing is to make sure that it's individualized because um, that's, you know, that's going to be a more appropriate um you know, kind of plan, if you go back to your Texas three-step, that that plan needs to be individualized. Um, we did have another parent on that asked a question about ESY services for preschoolers. So do you want to address that? Sure. It, does the kid have an IEP? Right. Does, if the kid has an IEP and you're going to an IEP meeting, ESY is there. Now it's a little dicier because they don't have the K through 12 type of, but if they're past uh, ECI zero to three and they're on an IEP, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, also out of state, you know, in Fort Hood, they say, oh, we, you know, we didn't have a chance to look at, that was another district. It applies, ESY applies to anyone. So if the kid's on an IEP and you're having an IP meeting, they don't always call it an IP. We call them ARDs here, CSCs in New York, uh, MET, I think METs in New Mexico and Arizona. So it could be called something different. But if your kid's on an IP, uh, the consider consideration of ESY services should be embedded in part of your process. Right, right. And and I think your earlier point about um, the parents finding out what that local policy is really important because what I found is sometimes the teachers really aren't that familiar with what local policy or procedure is. And so when the parent comes in and, and they're more knowledgeable about that, that can help even out that playing field when, you know, the parent has that information. Yeah, I can't stress having the same knowledge the teachers do, having the same policy procedures the teachers do, or sometimes the teachers 
because uh, ESY is not always uh, an automatic. You know, it, it requires discussion. Some folks do it with fidelity, sometimes don't. But remember, as a parent, you are the quality assurance. It's not the state review. It's not the federal review. It's not the uh, acknowledgement or receipt of federal funds. As a parent, you know your child best. You are the quality assurance piece for your child's plan. And so if you agree without reviewing the document, it's like you use Carlot as is till you get the next IEP meeting. So I can't stress, in fact, that's probably where I spend most of my time is you've got to dive into the deep end and it takes a little time to really understand the process that exists. Now, again, I, we've kind of templatized it because those three steps, it doesn't matter what the paperwork look, looks like, you're in one of those three steps of the entire art. That's it. Right, so right. There's some subtleties, but but on a specific piece, because ESY or maybe it's a, a, you know, when do you get OT or when you don't get OT, knowing what the school policies are and just in, in some, because, you know, how many teachers know what school policies are? Not few, but if you're the knowledgeable person on what school policies are, it gives you a lot more leverage in that conversation because that's what it is. It's a negotiation and right. sometimes negotiating with the North Koreans. And so it's a different kind of negotiation than if you're negotiating with the French. So to speak. Right. It, is, it is a negotiation, but I really want you to think about, so if you've been to a flea market, you've been to a used car lot, you play poker, it's a, you're, you're always weighing the different elements uh, it's, and it's not always black and white, but you do have your data. What does that data mean? So you can't go wrong uh, uh, knowing what data means, how the how they develop their plans. And if you know what, or, or another, let, oh, one more trick. Uh, uh, most states have wonderful open records procedures, okay? And what, and what they do, they always bring teachers back early in the year or sometimes in the summer and they train them. Or sometimes they have training days. Uh, anything that they've trained on is subject to open records requests. So a lot of times, uh, I remember it was it was related. We had ESY as part of it. Is we were wondering because you can be a great teacher. No, there's no doubt. I mean, if you, if you're going to earn money as a teacher in the wrong business, so usually teachers have a heart, even if it's, you're not getting along or it's a conflictual relationship or it's not as kosher as you'd like to see in terms of the relational possibilities between you and the school. But teachers are there generally for the right reason. We hope. We hope and pray, but getting uh, their in service on whatever that issue is, because eventually there's a ESY in service in your district or in your co-op or however they do that. And so not just knowing what the procedure is or what the state regs are, what what, what did the in service say for the teachers? And I find if I have what they were in service on, you got them because that's what they were taught. And so you're at that same level they are by knowing what that in service. I do that a lot with IEPs. Sometimes we get some really, you know, uh, rule of thumb here is you should all, I think, uh, I don't know if Pete Wright said it or somebody said it, but the IP should always have better than what a dead man can do. Right. The, the IP goes to be, yeah, he will sit in his seat quietly. Well, dead man can do that. That's, that doesn't work. So the standard should always be more than what a dead man can do. And so looking at how they were trained in the IPs or ESY in particular gives you a great uh, insight as to how they conceptualize what that is. Because some schools, larger schools, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, they have attorneys that come in and train to make them legally compliant. That's great. Uh, others, because uh, we have 1,300 districts where you have 150 kids in the district, your bus driver, autism specialist, and principal are all the same guy. And it's <laughs> knowledge of this little concept. So knowing what they trained on or what that is, really gives everybody a chance to learn together. Because when you talk about it, it is a team. You know, when parents say, well, the school did that. No, it, you are they, you is the they. It's, cool. it's a team and everybody has their distinct, distinct role. So anyway, we got a few I love that because I haven't ever thought about that. I mean, I had, you know, requests for records and I use a format that Judy Grant um, had shared with me one time, which is like really detailed, but I hadn't thought at all about asking for you know, what they're doing on their in-service days. So when you make that open record request, would you ask, I mean, would you be specific and say, sure, you know, sure. what the PowerPoint was or? I oh, mean, absolutely, what, yeah. At, on April 1st, uh, if they had an in-service day, send me your agenda and training on that in-service day. What was it? Because mm -hmm. sometimes it might be something that's already in the mix. It's very rarely is in-service training brand new. It's usually uh, re-emphasizing the point. 
Uh, some are your state uh, standards. You know, you have to be uh, certified in CPR every year or certified first aid or certified in uh, behavior management. Some of it's pretty routine, and that's good to know, too. But for ESY, it's not a heavy-duty consideration. Or uh, so, you know, how do they, what, are, what are their policies or what are their trainings? And that tells you exactly where the school benchmarks their knowledge, and that's your knowledge. So when you take it there, if ESY is kind of – sometimes ESY is important because the kid re really, really regresses. So we have kind of students on a permanent ESY status till they graduate just because of the nature of the disability – and the kid needs it. Others, it, go, it goes up and down depending on the kid, preference of the parent. But knowing what they do before you go in, what a great conversation. Oh, exactly. And I'm thinking of, um, you know, because I, what I like, too, is that these strategies work for beyond ESY. Like Erica, who's online with us, I said I've been working with her. And the school district recently had, and in this particular building had, and in service only for an hour and a half, which is too bad, but um, about, you know, strategies of working with students that have experienced trauma, and they brought in an outside expert. So, Erica, if you're still here with listening, that's our next step. We want to find out what they, what they uh, you know, taught the staff at that building, because that's a topic that we're really interested in for her son. Well, and, and trauma-informed care that is, you know, depending on where you're at, sometimes that's really starting to cook through some thresholds. There was, I think, a case filed in California where they wanted to make that another eligibility under IDA because huh. none of the traditional eligibilities fit a kid who needs that kind of trauma-informed care. Right, right. So, very, very, yeah, very exciting. So, knowing what their in-services are uh, or, you know, again, um, sometimes within your state, they will have, and again, everybody has their own uh, resources on who your district relies on. Because sometimes they have a guru who you're looking for. If you're in a town with a couple of universities, my goodness, that school is going to use that university. Or mm -hmm. if you're in a large city, or if you're not in a large city, who does the state reach out to? Because sometimes just that phone call to that person up at the state level, uh, especially because uh, you know state state education agencies are not that big. Even in Texas, there's only, you know, six, five, six hundred people. And if you call somebody two or three times, you're now you're, you're now uh, knowledgeable because you're asking, hey, I had this ESY come up. What about this, this and this? Well, uh, whoever each state has expertise in a certain area. So not just getting the in-services from the school or what the policy is or their operational manual. Ask well, who, who, who writes the regs for your state. Right. They're obviously the most knowledgeable. Why did you write that right? What, what was the behind it? Oh, yeah, because the superintendent of Muckety Muck says I was tired of ESY or whatever it is. So the educational community, especially between the higher echelon of schools, and they've been there a while, and state education agencies, you see a lot of blending back and forth. The superintendent over here might have been at the state level. And so there is kind of a common knowledge just among advocates. You, know, you can probably talk about here's the 200 advocates that do this around the state because you see each other in these types of forums. The same is true of your state. So um, getting to know uh, that that piece for your child, and it applies to ESY, but that's the subject tonight, but getting to know how they were trained. What is the policy? Just as a parent, it's an easy read, and you don't have to argue about that because yeah. it's their policy. Yeah, I think that's really, yeah, because like I said, I've, I don't know why, but I've never thought of that. And I think that's excellent because um, I know in most states, it seems like there's, you know, at least two, maybe more days set aside in the district calendar for professional development or in service. So, you know, each time that comes up, you know, during the school year, you know, we could just make it a, a regular practice that after they've had that in service that we ask for that open record request to see exactly. And I've tried to also help in some districts are open to that where when they have trainings is to make them open to parents because I think the more that we can have parents and staff hearing the same message at the same time, that just does wonders for, you know, equalizing that understanding versus you know, them having this grip on what the knowledge is and parents aren't able to access it, you know? Well, the IEP team that trains together stays together. 
well, you know, unless there's a prohibition for folks not to attend teacher trainings, go all the time. You can bring that up as uh, as the IP because if the teacher's getting trained on a specific X or Z, why wouldn't the parent need to be trained or become part of in-home service training? Why? I mean, if there's something that's going to help the teacher uh, do better with their scope and sequence or their drill and kill or whatever their style is, why wouldn't the parent want to do that? Assuming parents have time, because that's the other thing you run into. Um, so knowing how te uh, teachers train, uh, I, I have found to be one of an incredibly rich source and saves a lot of wear and tear because you're not arguing from your point of view. You're saying, hey, this is the training you have. Why aren't we doing this? This is your policy. Why are we following this? And sometimes the uh, aha light will come on very quickly because it's their training, it's their policy, and it gives you, you're arguing with their information or with their knowledge. Because a lot of times where parents get cut up, we had Dr. XYZ, gave us an evaluation, says the child needs ESY or needs X, and, and that's fine, but that individual is not in the ecological system of the school. And so right. when you think about the ecosystem of the school, that's their knowledge base. That's how they navigate their world. So if you're part of their world, it's easier to have a conversation than if you're bringing outside someone from your local educational ecosystem. Right. And I think that's one of the things that's helped me as an advocate because I was a special ed teacher and I was a classroom teacher. And after 30 years, I retired. But I, I know that system and and so I think in a way that helps dispel some defensiveness of, you know, I've been where you are and I understand the paperwork and I understand all the headaches that come with it. But also as a parent, I know that we have to speak up for our kids, you know, so That's it. That can make that difference. Well, here, here's here. Anybody who's listening tonight, here's what I always offer as part of the insert because I always enjoy having, uh, I don't know if my information is helpful, maybe it wasn't, maybe there's more. My email is real simple because I was a Marine Corps Sergeant and I do special ed. I'm a special ed Marine at Yahoo, special ed Marine, just as it sounds, special ed Marine at Yahoo. Send me a question. I Whenever I do an in-service, you I will answer any question or even talk to you if you want me to. For two weeks, free of charge. Two weeks, free of charge. Offer, so yeah. <laughs> I'll make so, sure. so you're welcome. So those folks who, who uh, saw this, now this does not, uh, this is, uh, you see this three weeks later, and I'm just uh, kind of the, you know, re repeat here. No, that doesn't extend. But three weeks from uh, 3 16, 2017 to benchmark the tape. But I, I, if there's some things you want to know a little more, uh, in Texas, we have toolboxes, toolbox or ESY, and there's just a lot more information you can't put together in just uh, an hour. You, know, you yeah. can touch on and, and really just having some conceptual pieces, you know, it's data driven, consensus based, applies relationships. So you want data at all times, no matter what it is. And then there's that three steps, assessment drives the plan, crime drives the placement. You don't like the placement, you don't like the plan. What does the assessment tell you? And that's your discussion. And if you ever go into litigation, you're going to be asking the same question. So why not ask the question of the IP meeting and save litigation to the very minuscule part it takes place and, and knowing what they do. That's why, I'm, that's why I love their special op, special ed operations manual of any district I might be struggling with, assuming it's more than one IP meeting or what their in-service uh, is on that particular area. It just makes the conversation smooth. Oh, I know. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, it makes a ahead. huge difference. And, and like I said, these tips go for any subject. Like, you know, there's some, um, cases of restraint and seclusion that I'm helping parents with right now, and they have a district procedure and guidelines on it, but you can't find it on your on their website anywhere. And so unless parents know to specifically ask for a copy of it, that's not just handed over to parents. So, you know, sometimes looking and doing a scavenger hunt on a district's website, you might not find it but go to somebody and, and make that specific request. And then, you know, sometimes you uncover wonderful things that really can help you as you're advocating and negotiating. Well, one last thought on it. It doesn't always have to be a record request. You say, hey, bring that training to the IP meeting. Um, you know, make it part of the official R document. Because if you ever have to go, you know, in other words, hey, my kid's been restrained five times 
and and certainly might be doing the, looking at the IP to build skills to not restrain. There might be the BIP in case it does happen. It might be a related service of counseling or uh, some other inter intervention. But also, why not bring what your policy and procedure are to the R so we can review it? Does it work for the kid? Is it does that cookie cutter policy? work on the kid's unique individualized needs. So a lot of ways, it's not just an open record request, which you can do, bring it to the R. That way it becomes an official part of the R document, which helps benchmark that. Oh yeah, totally, yeah. As much as we can get in writing in the IEP, it's gonna be helpful. And then make sure that it's you know real specific. But I just, I so appreciate your time tonight, David, because like- Oh, it's I been a blast. And thank you for coming on to Advocate Late Night. It's, uh, for those out there, we're all COPA members. If you're not a member of COPA, we hope you join. It's room for parents, attorneys, and advocates. The idea is to break down the walls just because I'm an advocate or you're a parent or somebody's an attorney, and it's all IDA. We serve kids with disabilities. That's what unites us all. And I heard a stat in COPA, which I thought was pretty good. I think it was 86 or 87% of all the members of COPA have a child with a disability or disability oh. themselves or a family member with disability. So. Uh, you're in a community that is sensitive and uh, likes to talk about this stuff as Charmaine and I. So I'm here I am in rural nowhere, Texas. She's in Idaho. Uh, Technology is wonderful. So Charmaine, thank you very, very much. Uh, those who listen in now or in the future, thank you for spending a lot of time with us. Really, really appreciate it. If you want a question answered, feel free to email me. There's no secret about what we do. And we try to conceptualize, kind of synthesize uh, our experience uh, in such a way. And I'll say, and I always like to say with the final thought, it's kind of like with the, the Dalai Lama. He's 80 some years old. He studied all the great world religions and he's looked on as a wise man. So one reporter asked him, Dalai Lama, you've studied all these religions for 60 years. What does it mean? What is the meaning of life? And the Dalai Lama said, so, oh, I do not know what it is. All I know is in this world, we're to help each other. If not, we don't hurt them. That's all I know. So keeping it simple. So here he is after, you know, these great books of the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Bible, the Torah, he synthesized all this to two basic things. So that's why in what we do or what you do for your child, keep it real simple, keep it in that conceptual grasp, assessment drives plan, plan drives placement. It's something we came up with Hurricane Katrina to teach what ideas really, really quick. Your child's education shouldn't be complicated. On that night, on that note, Semper Fi. Thank you so much, sir. And for all of you that might be watching it on the replay, it stays up on my Facebook page. I also, um, by tomorrow, will have it on my YouTube channel, which is Collaborative Special Education Advocacy. And I hope that you'll join us next Thursday. We're gonna continue our conversation about ESY services. But each Thursday night at seven o'clock, you can find us here on the Facebook page. So again, aloha, David, and safe travels to Illinois this evening. And we shall see everybody next week. Thank you. Uh, adios. <laughs>